Sounds good. All right. Thanks so much, Ruben, for joining me. Uh, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Would you like to start by telling us some information about your background and how Windmill got started? Sure. Um, so I'm French. I did my study at EPFL in Switzerland, and then I did some research at Stanford on compilers. Um, I really like building, uh, I think, abstraction for developers to build systems and programming language is one way to do that. Uh, and then I wanted to continue in academia, but then I realized writing papers was not necessary for me. And then I joined like a big tech company, uh, Palantir, for two years, uh, learned about dev tools there. I actually uh, liked a lot building tools for other software engineers. They have really high requirements, but they're also very genuine in the way, in their feedback and what they like. And the product that they want is very, I'll say, uh, as, um, it are very exciting to build. So stay two years there, then uh, uh, became head of engineering of a small startup called Infair, where I kind of like learned the, the, how like the, the up and downs of startups and you know, how it is to kind of like make a small, small uh, company work. And, and also like the, with the rapid nature of change that is uh, go, I'll say against a bit what you learn in big tech, which is like, you know, build things extremely stable, uh, take your time and everything. Um, so after two years and a half, I kind of like had the, the itch to build Windmill. I saw, I, I felt the need for myself to have such solution and there were like some close source, um, I'll say alternative at that point to something that would have been some inspiration for Windmill, but I felt like really we needed something like an open source solution for that as a developer. Like I didn't want to trust my tools to like a closed source solution. And it's also kind of like at the intersection of many of my interests. So compilers, distributed systems, building dev tools, like uh, really, really there was like a lot. I, I, I could almost work it for, on it for free. Uh, it just happened that I also think it has a lot of like business opportunities. So lucky me. Um, I started that uh, six months solo founder, uh, completely bootstrapped on my own. I applied uh, to YC, not thinking I had a chance, especially being a solo founder. And somehow I got in. And uh, three months later, uh, I was uh, well prepared uh, by YC to do our fundraise and everything, uh, which uh, yeah went well. And then I, I assembled the team and we're now close to do our 1.0 or 2.0 launch because the product, which is very ambitious, is now basically uh, good enough for production system. So it's a very exciting time for us. It does a lot of things. It's that intersection of may, many well-known tools, so temporal, retool. And the basic idea is that um, you can, as a software engineer, uh, you want to be able to write code, but a lot of like code, like systems that force you to code from scratch are not necessarily productive enough. And so I didn't think there was like the right compromise between no code, low code or full code. And so I built it. And so this is like a system where you can put code where it actually matters. And so like mostly like in the little composable steps uh, of flows or basically being able to like transform like a little script into like a, a front end that is automatically generated. Because in my opinion, there's two kinds of code. Well, it, it's in a generalization, but there's like code that matters and code you care about and you, you want to have like a lot of like care being given to and code that is mostly boilerplate that needs to be there to make things work. Uh, but it's kind of like, if you if, if it could kind of like disappear. And so a lot of like local no code tools, they make everything disappear. We only make the boilerplate part disappear. Uh, so, and so, and to be a bit more clear into what we're able to do, it's uh, um, so sharing scripts, uh, workflows and ETLs. Um, so you know, for people that know Airflow or Temporal, this is what we do. And the last is to build UIs for uh, admin panels, dashboards. So basically everything uh, to build your own internal tools. I love it. Thanks for the introduction. And from what I understand, the Windmill platform and infrastructure is very modular. And there's a community that also builds a lot of things, makes it available to others. So are there some favorite or very popular projects you'd like to talk about, things people do with Windmill? And so, so we're still at the very early stage. And like the things people mm. do are like, Kind of like uh, some of them are I can disclose or or they're just not that um, I'll say um, not that crazy yet, right? It's just that, but the constant feedback that we have is that it's one system that is extremely flexible and a system in which otherwise they would have to write everything from scratch. And so 
people write like integration between uh, uh, I don't know Excel and BigQuery. Uh, they write their entire ETL on it. They actually use it solely for the worker queue system that we have. So we have like a a bigger client that basically uh, just use it for the work like runtime that we provide. The the API is completely open source and like very well documented too. So you can use some of the layers without need, like using all of the layers. Um, so the thing you mentioned where the community can contribute is the hub. And the hub is something that we're probably the only one to be able to do in this form because what we do is we try to transform automatically scripts into local modules and 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 so the compared to Zapier or many other kind of tools where basically they have to provide all of the modules and pre-made integrations. We can have the community just send scripts, uh, share the script with the, on the hub. We verify them, make sure that they're not doing anything shady. And then basically it creates like a library of like pre-made integrations where most of them are leveraging like a library that already exists, but putting in a nice way that you can compose it into flows. So the other thing is like compared to a lot of like other systems, because we took a lot of care to be able to allow anyone to use any dependencies and like supporting Python TypeScript, a lot of like those languages already support a lot of integration because they have well-made libraries. And so we just allow people to basically format that into like atomic uh, single unit of scripts and have them being composable into much more complex flows. Hey, um, I, I think I understand it personally. <laughs> and uh, so now you mentioned that from the get go, that it was clear that you're going to open source this. Do you want to briefly talk about how you attracted first contributors before even going production ready and how you picked the license, you know, from the basic things to. So I think, so first I think why did I pick open source is something that was close to my heart. Uh, like I'm a software engineer, I think software, uh, it should be, I don't know if it should be free, but it should be open. I, I think it's really important for the rate of innovation of humankind. And like, I, I don't like the, I, I, I think the the, the locking effect of like closed source software is something that I think is is uh, is is un unplan unpleasant as developers something you don't want to that you're forced into because sometimes they're much better than the alternatives and so I, I thought this time I was going to build like a open source software that was actually better than the alternative uh, and so the other thing is like this is infra this is like to basically not only like a local tool, but also the runtime to run it. And no serious software engineer would build their infra on top of closed source solutions. So you can think of like Kafka, Kubernetes, Airflow, all of this. They're part of their reason why they're successful is because they are open source. So it wasn't, I felt like it was almost kind of like obvious that it needed to be done. On the contributors front, we're not at the stage yet where we have many contributors. Uh, I think like we have a lot of sympathy from developers, so we get a lot of feedback. It helps with the QA. They they contribute to the hub, but it's not like basically the reason Windmill is able to iterate so fast is because we have many contributors. It's more like we build everything in the open. Uh, if you're curious, you can basically look at the code, look at see that we're not doing anything shady. See that for the part that are probably the most important to understand, they are actually pretty simple, and that you know you, you can trust that we, you know this is working as intended. Uh, rather than basically having a lot of like free work given to us, basically. And are you currently focusing conversations with a specific type or size of company or team? Because I understand it can cover the whole spectrum. Uh, where do you put your so, so yeah, it can cover the whole spectrum, but where we think we have a very strong competitive advantage is for so either software companies, so companies with a lot of software engineers, like a or 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 bigger enterprise that basically have a lot of like complexity around needing to air gap everything. So they want to be self-host air gap everything. And so here basically what they can do is like, if our interface is too technical for them, they can build their own front end on top of it or simplify some aspect. But it's 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 um, a lot of like alternative would basically do a hybrid model where you send a lot of telemetry, especially with GPDR and like a lot of other regulation, it's, it's just impossible. So they, the only alternative they have is to rebuild everything from scratch. So we are a nicer alternative to that. So both cases, we have like a very clear advantage. If it's like for power users, so developers or hybrid teams with at least a high proportion of like software engineers, we like, we build the local tools 
that software engineers like. And for like situation where you want to be completely air gapped and have complete control, this is where we have like a lot of advantage. You, the, the third one I think is we do a lot of things. So we're like a, a holistic framework. And so compared to temporal, like temporal only do workflows compared to like at Retool, Apps, Smith, Tool, Jet, they mostly focus on UI. We do the whole thing, which is nice to like have in, have in an, one integrated manner that is extremely consistent. So, and um, so the, yeah. What would you say is the next milestone for, for the project right now? So first we need to do a, a proper launch. So basically we did a launch for public. It's nothing is secret, but it's just that we, we, we have spent the last five months uh, building a lot because we had this vision of like everything needed to make sense together and we built it. And now we need to document it properly, like we do our launch page, uh, build some use case with our design partner. So it's like that milestone, which is coming in the next few weeks is very important for us. And then it's gonna be a lot of iteration. So we build, basically build uh, all the important foundations. They were, they're actually pretty advanced and probably that's because I'm an engineer, the founder, and I wanted things to be, for the V1 to be extremely advanced already. Uh, but then it's gonna be a lot of iteration of like, first achieving 100% reliability, correctness every time. Um, also sometimes the features that are you, the, like get a bit of feedback on the feature that people want us to prioritize. We can go in a lot of directions. So it's like, it's not the lack of ideas. But like being multi prioritized correctly. And it's also um, growing up in the kind of audience that we target. So right now, we, I think the, the primary uh, audience is going to be smaller companies, but we're going to go bigger and bigger as we mature. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, comparing that to the, your experience from your previous companies, the startups you worked at, you know, what are the challenges that you faced as an open source maintainer? Has it been too long, but from, from the time so far? Um, so I, I think we have a bit of like, we have a higher standards in the sense of like, you know, you cannot do some shady stuff because it's it solves the solution quickly because it's public, right? So you, you're, you would be ruining your reputation and your image uh, and, and everything to be, I think we cannot afford to make like naive mistakes. And so, that puts a lot of pressure on us. Uh, I think one thing is to realize that there are different stages in the company. And like, especially at the very beginning, sure, you're building things in the open. It doesn't mean everything needs to be perfect. It's better to iterate fast and to be able to ship and have like people being able to kind of like try and enjoy the product versus than just saying like, my code is beautiful and everyone will like reading my code. So uh, that, that's one thing is like is almost a mental barrier, right? Is like, you, um, and I think this, the second thing is like people are very, especially I think it's, it's more related to DevTool, but people are very specific requests. And so the question is like, do, do this request uh, basically generalize to everyone or are they very niche? Um, it's that's something I think at the very beginning you cannot know because you don't have enough data points. And so you always have the temptation to just satisfy everyone, which is pretty much what we're doing. But I think in the long term, it, it can be like a slippery slope, especially as you're you're building a product, and that could give a direct like you could sense your main direction and focus doing that because there is always a nice new feature to build. Mm, absolutely, thanks for sharing that. Uh, sounds like the table stakes are much higher out of the gate, and then you're getting pulled in all these different directions. Where you're gonna go, and does it generalize? You're absolutely right. You mentioned that you're a solo founder, and on top of that, you bootstrap. Uh, windmill in the beginning so would you like to briefly uh talk about this uh personally yeah I, I, I mean the beautiful thing about being a software engineer is, is that you don't need anything else than a laptop and a internet connection to start building software so it, i pretty much did that for six months i had a bit of money saved up and i mean i, I was in a fortunate situation where i could afford to do that i think after six months it was not so much that my savings would have been dried up that my motivation was going to start uh, basically um, deteriorate because it's it's it gets lonely you know it's like you really believe in your project every corner does but doing it solo is like it's a, a, something you really have to manage is your motivation and your energy and I, I 
I, I think YC really came at the right time. Me, I was starting like especially for such an ambitious project. It needs a bit of time, and now we've done the work and it's ready. But it wasn't ready after six months, and and so I I think YC uh, m m gave me a great uh, did me a great service by you know like uh, being at the right time for me. Uh, and so I I think not everyone has a chance to uh, go into YC. And I think this is probably the most dangerous thing, which is like you lose motivation. And so I don't think it's about resource. It's like mo mostly about being in a, like in a, in a uh, framework or like in an environment where you can do the long run and not just the exciting stuff of the very beginning. Absolutely. Bravo. No, I'm, I love it. I'm really, I'm really happy for this. Um, taking a few steps back, uh, could you how, how are you approaching monetization at this stage, if at all? Because you are going down a commercial path after all. You did fund the company. Yeah. yeah. So funny you ask. We actually like uh, finalized the pricing yesterday. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, we're not so different from any other companies. And we probably took the best out of what's being done by all the open source companies. But we basically... There's like a free open source edition that you can do however you want, and that we're never going to put any arbitrary restrictions. And I think a lot of, like a lot of, open source project when they get a, a bit more funding or commercialized, they have the temptation to like, put some gates on it. This is something we're really careful. Like I, I want people that have the, I'll say, uh, want to self-host everything and air gap everything to always be able to do that. So. But they're like uh, two other people, which is like basically the, the people that want us to host it um, and the enterprise. And like I think enterprise, they have like, they want support. They want some very specific plugins. They want SLA. Um, they, so there's kind of like a lot of requirements, which for enterprise, we are so cheap. Uh, like that, you know, it's like just the spending an hour deciding if they want, or like, like you know, it's like a, a few hours deciding if they want to do it or not is the price that they would pay for the world months of like having us host it. So it's like, there's like some, I'll say, uh, logic for enterprise where it's just, it's, they want to not lose focus and they have like a lot of cost of like trying to do things themselves. And so for them, we have like enterprise license. So we have like a hosted solution for small teams, a hosted solution for uh, enterprise and a self-hosted license for enterprise. The self-hosted license for enterprise is because we, we do provide some plugins that make sense at scale. And when you have like compliance requirements, so mostly tools around uh, export of the audit logs or like a, a very complex distributed cache systems that require more components, which is really more why we don't include it in the open source version. And then of course we provide priority support and, and all the kind of like things that are uh, where if it if it's used in a critical manner, any hour, any bugs, any hour of like uh, um, uh, not being operational is is something that costs them a lot more than any enterprise license would cost them. So for them, it's a no brainer. Um, the team, the team, you know, like the team plan is 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 pretty cheap. Uh, it's like ten dollar a month, basically. Uh, if that becomes a service that is critical to your company, you will probably find that pretty cheap. And the goal is, of course, that it doesn't cost us a lot necessarily to kind of like have this kind of compute on our servers. And we probably want to be in on a model where uh, as much people can enjoy this kind of software. So either because they have the energy to self-host it or because we provide it for cheap for like small teams and then enterprise are where we make most of our revenues. Uh, I like, it's an open source project. I think for me, like the, when there's a trade-off to be made between having more adoption or extracting more profit from each like uh, user will always go toward adoption. This is like a very generic software that could save a lot of time to engineers. And this is what motivates me. Uh, the fact that we can make a very sensible business out of it is, is, is the chance and like something that we're gonna do, but not the, I'll say the, the primary motivation for me. Thanks for making this remark. Uh, and now with, you know, increasing pool from the market, uh, you know, pricing being in place, production ready, rolling it out to enterprises, and with the funding in place, um, are you currently thinking about growing the team to support all that? And if so, how do you approach it? Or are you good for now? And 
maybe later? Um, for now, we have like the team work really well together, and I, I think it's kind of like it's not everything scales so well. And, and myself, you know, going to, so we're five currently, and I think going from five to ten is going to be a huge milestone. I think the, us being like a small team give us a lot of flexibility, flexibility that was really required uh, when we were building everything. Now we need to basically get more signals from the market uh, to see if basically our team or the size of the team is a bottleneck. If that's the case, then we will scale. But I think preemptively scale is something that is very dangerous, especially in, in the troubled economy that we're in. And I rather have focus on like a few key people uh, that I can trust rather than just kind of like adding more and more people. So uh, I'll say we could grow the team really quickly if we have the right signals from the market. Right now, we're probably good. And so it depends. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, no, yeah, and, and I think that's the right way to approach it. Absolutely. Um, have you had any major surprises so far building open source? Um, not really. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like, um, I think there is a, people understand what we're doing. It's also something that is very, I, I would have expected a lot more, I'll say, people tinkering with it, but it's also a very complex system and not everything is like super well documented. And I understand it's like, it's a lot for someone to like go on, on it and, uh, and tinker with it. Um, I think we were a, a bit, we're gonna reach the phase of like being like not only open source, but extremely pro proper and, and very well documented and everything. So I want to see how does it interact with open source at that point, mm -hmm. because the, like this, this is gonna be like not, not just new software or like software that kind of like has a good backend and that works, but that, that is ugly or like inconvenient to use. It's gonna be like software that we actually enjoy to use and it's beautiful. And so I, I want to see basically uh, if the number of contributors, tinkers increase or if it's just the number of adopters, uh, so just users. And that's probably going to happen in the next few weeks with a proper launch coming up. So you know, hopefully crossing, a lot of tinkering. Crossing <laughs> fingers, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, have there been uh, specific people in the open source community, maybe other founders that you followed, took their advice to heart? Um, yeah. I, I, so first I was in a section at YC where we were all open source founders and I think we're all busy having the same questions and there's no stupid questions and everyone is figuring out. Uh, I think PostHog is, is known to be, you know, pretty well respected in the open source YC community. And in general, I, my inspiration, I think go for all the very inspiring open source projects, which is like Linux, Kafka, Postgres, you know, it's like all the, those big SQLite, all, all those amazing engineer, engineering, which is completely open source and kind of like have enabled everyone else to build on top of them and build what, you know, it's like the software ecosystem that we have today. So I, I think those are kind of like, uh, I would call like serious engineering. I think a lot of like open source is kind of like divided between kind of people that treat it as a hobby and people that are kind of like uh, want to do serious engineering. And I, I think kind of like it's, it's, it's important to have both. But sometimes I think there's a temptation to think that because it's free and because it's open source, it's not serious engineering. And I think those those projects kind of like prove that probably it's actually the opposite. Like the most serious engineering is open source. And this is the reason why you would want your infrastructure to rely on it. And so those projects pioneering it and like kind of like being like a stellar example that serious engineering can be done and should be done in open source is, is something that is really motivating. Um, and and is is this why you would say basically is what has changed over the last few years in this ecosystem? Because it feels like something has changed. So that remark for sure, you know, there's this proof that the engineering is top notch. Uh, is there another uh, comment here about what is different? Um, sorry, can can you? Yeah, um, maybe I didn't. More like to, to, to me, it looks like things are a little different uh, in the way this ecosystem evolving. So you're saying you would say the biggest difference today compared to just a few years ago is that now we have proof that all this. Uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it, it's no. I think my remark was a bit like more on the longer term. I think 10 mm -hmm. years ago, 20 years ago, that was something. Mm -hmm. Now everyone realizes this, this is nothing kind of like that. But but I, I 
you know, they took time to be built. And I think it's more me wanting to pay tribute to those people, like doing it like when it wasn't obvious. I think lately, yes, like open source is like every like there's a mentality shift in the last few years where more and more people realize this. And I think like more and more software is done open source. And kind of like we have a bit of like less, uh, I'll say, uh, reptilian response to open source. Like because the first thing you hear when you tell people it's open source is is like, but you're giving it for free. It's like how are you gonna make money and like like and and so it's like now people realize it, it's a lot more understood that yeah this can make money. This can actually make a lot of money. It's serious business. It's serious engineering. So it's something where I think you have a lot less dumb conversation about. And people are getting a lot more educated about it. So that has changed. And the number of like, great software companies, startups that are building open source has also, I think, exploded. So we're just one of the many cool companies building open source. Absolutely. And it is a little hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads, their, their heads around it. And I think this, this series helps with this. Uh, personally, from your experience so far, is there a piece of advice or maybe a, a, a pitfall to avoid? Um, something to share with other founders, yeah. I I think, I mean, it's going to sound a bit uh, cliche, but just do it. I mean, like, at some point, it's kind of like, you always are like, I have a ton of reason not to try and not to kind of like, I don't know, you you have a job, you have like, uh, you don't feel confident uh, yourself enough, it's too hard, there's already competition. Like, so many reasons why not to start. And I think this is something like most be because... It's, it's scary, not because they're they, like it's, but it, what I think, and especially as a sort of founder, uh, I realize it's, it's really easy to start a company to, uh, nowadays. It's like, we have like a lot of like great startup to like help you like doing corporation, build like great stack so that you don't need an account. And like, you don't need an army of people to actually like do the, uh, the, the part where you look like a legitimate company, what you have to actually do is like build something that people want and build a great product. And as software engineers, we can try. Uh, will we succeed? I, I don't know, but you can try and you can try with just a laptop and internet connection and an idea here. So just do it. I think that would be like my advice. Uh, and I think it's kind of like, uh, it's like running uh, in, in a way, which is like the first time you run or like you train for the marathon, it's very hard, but if you do it a bit every day, like it gets easier and so it's like there's a bit of like it seems like uh like an impossible challenge when you start it's like but actually like you spend six months in six months seven months in then you know like you kind of like go over the obstacles one by one and then things actually become a lot more realistic than you know you get your first client second you know third and then you know it's like and then every time it just seems more likely you are is it's actually gonna become like a an actual company rather than like something in your head so absolutely uh i, I agree 100 percent. and and equally so encourage people to just do it as you said <laughs> as a um I'm, I'm curious to hear i don't know if there's something to say here but you know you you're from france and you know emmanuel from somatic you're in the same batch is there anything you could say about the french startup ecosystem um <laughs> no i i would say so in france has a culture of being very uh, engineeringly driven, especially mm -hmm. around mathematics theory, and we're very stubborn. So I think kind of like this, kind of like those are nice. Uh, I'll say uh, uh, traits for founders. Uh, the, on the other side, the ecosystem can be a bit not very encouraging. So for instance, uh, failure is very looked down upon. And so it's kind of like, it's not a great fit for the startup culture, which is like, you know, try lots of things, fell off them, and then, and, and, you know, just try again. Um, but I, like, for the startups that are going to be more going toward deep tech, I really think there is a strong fit between, like, the values we have in the engineering culture in France and the kind of, like, uh, I'll say rigorous mindset uh, that you need to to apply to succeed. So I, I I do think there's a great future for France, but basically we also need to change a lot of mentality, mm -hmm. especially around entrepreneurship, like innovation mentality, like absolutely, absolutely taking risks and everything. So I I, I don't think we have like our cake uh, cut for us, but I think we also have like some really interesting advantage, like like many other European countries. Yes, and 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 where 
we, we sh I, I think we like it's not um sometimes it looks like compared to the us uh we we're never gonna be able to compete for so many reasons i i, I think it's kind of like it, yes we're, we're behind for sure 100 percent like uh but we also have like we, it's not an impossible thing to catch up and and we could do it so i i want to be very optimistic about that yes yes uh and I, and I agree with the comment i see the same sort of like mentality here in greece i think it's widespread around europe and i don't know if you know a solution in the right direction would maybe start from the universities and uh you know moving closer to how the things we see in the us with student entrepreneurship that might be one of the most um any any closing remarks that you would like to leave people with? Um, not really. I mean, it was a. Um, I'll thank you for you know you, uh, taking the time to, to do this. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's like uh, uh, starting a company, especially in open source, is something that I don't know is the best thing that happened to me. Like it's very hard. Like it's not very hard. I mean, like there's a lot of like very painful situation for people, but I think it takes a lot of like energy. But for me, it's been a bliss. Kind of like uh, I'm every morning I wake up, I know you know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it for. I don't know if it's gonna work out, but I think kind of like this is some like the 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 it's the kind of like adventure of my life, and I'm very grateful to be in this position. And I would really encourage people to kind of like try, and even if they have to give up after a year or not, but this is something you you probably want to do once in your life, and it gives a lot of uh, uh, a sense of purpose, I, I think, which is very nice. Absolutely, I, I get encouraged uh, hearing you say all these things. So. Absolutely, and uh, you know, everyone, stay tuned in a few weeks' time for the launch of of Windmill, and at that point, with all the tickering taking place, probably the project opens up more to contributors and, and building that base. Right? So, certainly, and, and you know, it's all in Rust and Velt. Those are very cool technologies and it's doing cool and hard things. And so, yeah, we'd we'll love to get like your, I'll say, review, feedback, uh, critiques uh, of like what we're doing. I, I know like engineers can be very kind of like uh, a very strong opinions but we welcome strong opinions so feel free to join our discord tell us that you, you don't agree with our decisions we we'll love to we'll, we would love it so yeah awesome awesome and, and i would love to you know check in again in six months or 12 and see all the progress being made and the amazing things uh people do with windmill uh thank you so much for for doing this uh with me ruben i really appreciate it me too have a great day thank you you too thank you thank you and enjoy san francisco thank you <laughs> thank, thank you, you. <laughs> Bye.